Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the se second session of the day. Uh, today we have the pri privilege of the presence of Professor M. Son Raja. Uh, <coughs> I would like to, I'll, I'll start with the introduction of life and works of Professor Son Raja. He was born in Sri Lanka, educated in Sri Lanka, Yale in London. He has taught full time in Sri Lanka, Tasmania and Singapore and has had a uh, number of visiting positions uh, in different universities around the world, as well as different research centers. Uh, he has taught family law, uh, criminal uh, law, and international economic law. And international economic law happens to be his main area of research now. So, yeah, that's his <laughs> So he'll talk now. <laughs> uh, I taught Prabhagar. Prabhagar is an old friend. So uh, I was his PhD supervisor. So I know that if uh, <laughs> I know that he would go on and on about this. <laughs> so uh, let me start. Uh, you know, it's uh, such a distinct pleasure to be with you here in. Uh, at King's College because it was the place at which, at, uh, it was one of the places at which I studied law. And across the road at LSE, there too I studied. And as Prabhagar said, I studied law at uh, Yale as well. And uh, I think Daniel was talking about lenses. The vision of the law that I had in all these three universities was the same. It was the same lens through which I looked at the law. Uh, in England, it was very positivistic, so that you only looked at the cases and uh, the statutes and the treaties and came to a decision. At Yale, of course, they said that policy was important, but you arrived at uh, a result that always ensured that the American interest triumphed. So uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, idea was that I should then develop another lens uh, altogether. And this is what I have striven to do, uh, uh, to, to uh, try to sort of see the law in uh, a different way from uh, how others have seen it. Uh, and uh, of course, in the process of that, I have uh, always said that there should be no such thing called transnational law. And Pierre, who is also an old friend, has uh, always been kind to me. He has uh, ensured that I am invited to his institute, uh, a major institute, developing into a major institute, despite the transgressions that uh, uh, I have made as regards uh, transnational law. I think uh, the last lecture I gave uh, at King's was, why no to transnational law? So. Uh, <laughs> Despite that, I think uh, it's a measure of the Institute and the peer as a scholar that uh, he would have me again to talk at his Institute. The, what, what I have to say here really goes back uh, a long time in my, my youth when I had uh, uh, a great deal of certainty about what I had to say. And in 1982 or so, I wrote an article called The Myth of International <coughs> Contract Law, in which I suggested that uh, <coughs> the law relating to international contracts, or transnational law, as it was known at uh, that stage, was constructed largely through, uh, through uh, low order sources of international law, like general principles of law, or arbitral decisions. Uh, the uh, if you remember the statute of the International Court of Justice, which, uh, uh, which uh, sets out the sources of international law, it uh, deals with general principles of law, the writings of highly qualified publicists, of which I am not one, because you have to, be, uh, to belong to certain universities to be that. So, and then, of course, the arbitral decisions are decisions of judges and perhaps of arbitrators. So these are low order sources which can be manipulated by private power. So the thesis that I advanced then was that uh, private power was able to make public international law through the manipulation of low order sources. Uh, 
So we would then think in terms of the existence of not international law, but perhaps something less than international law, transnational law or supranational law, which was constructed largely through arbitral decisions, writings on those arbitral decisions by highly qualified publicists, and further arbitral decisions which follow the initial arbitral decisions. So I was able to demonstrate uh, the idea that international contract law, as it was known at uh, that time in 1982, was uh, <clears throat> a myth because of the fact that it was constructed in uh, a rather illegitimate manner through the use of uh, uh, low order sources in order to foster the interests of certain groups of uh, the international community, largely the multinational companies which took capital from one state to another. I would then argue now that uh, this has a long history. Each time there was uh, a colonial experience that uh, took place in uh, the world, <coughs> there was a particular device that had been constructed by the leading lawyers of the time. So for example, from the time of uh, the Spanish Empire, we have the idea that uh, uh, put forward by writers like Vittoria principally, that uh, there was a right on the part of Spain to uh, trade with, uh, with uh, the Aztecs and the Incas, that uh, they had a right to conquer them because of the fact that uh, the practices that were adopted by the Incas and the Aztecs were not humanitarian, they recognized human sacrifice, which was cruel, and so greater cruelty was done to them in order to do away with uh, uh, the cruelties that they practiced so that the gold could be transported from, uh, South, uh, South, uh, from South America back to Spain. So what we have here is the construction of a particular justification that uh, you simply had to do this in order to impose a superior culture, a superior set of values on people who were not used to these higher moral values. The idea simply is that you had a right to trade, that you had a right to impose higher moral standards, that you had a right to use force in uh, circumstances where there was injurious conduct committed by the, uh, the Aztecs or the Incas, and that as a, as a result of these uh, principles, it was possible to bring about a system of colonial rule on uh, the people of, uh, of uh, Latin America. Each time there is a colonial endeavor, we find a justification that is put forward in rather similar terms. So we finish with, uh, with uh, Vittoria, we go to Grotius, we have a similar justification that is put up that there is a right to trade, that there is a freedom of the high seas, that, uh, that there is a right to conquer, that uh, people in Africa and Asia do not have personality to enjoy uh, the protection of international law, that it is a European system that is confined to, as uh, the statute of the International Court of Justice would put it, the civilized nations of the world. Because uh, the uh, Africans and the Europeans did not belong to these, uh, this, the, the civilized nations of the world, and the idea was that until they are brought to this standard of civilization. So there was this employment of this idea of a standard of civilization. <coughs> Unless the people are brought up to this standard of civilization, they could not enjoy personality. So you would be able to uh, take over land of Aboriginal people, the native Indians, on the basis that these lands were terra nullius, unoccupied by anyone, despite the fact that the Aboriginal people had been uh, in those territories for a substantial period of time. So the construction of international law was something that always favored colonialism. There was one part which dealt with interstate relations, another part which uh, sought to deal with, uh, with uh, private relationships. So, for example, the idea that uh, there could be property 
that property could be transferred by Native Indians to the Spanish, uh, or that property could be transferred by uh, the people of Southeast Asia to the Dutch. These were also regulated in the writings of Grotius. So one part of the law of nations that was constructed by these early writers dealt with uh, inter interstate relations. Of course, the, Africa, the Asian and African princes not having the same status as the European princes. But another part of it concerned the idea of property transactions and the making of commercial relationships. There was much to, deal, to do with uh, the, the protection of what uh, Vittoria spoke of as dominium in, uh, uh, in his uh, De Indis, the book uh, that he wrote concerning uh, relations with uh, uh, Indians, meaning the, the Aztecs and the Incas. So this, this part of uh, the notion of constructing property relations, contractual relations, I would describe as uh, the proper origins of transnational law. We have in this idea the notion of the insulation of these concepts from the scope of the laws of the people in whose countries these relationships took place. So this was central to the construction of this notion of a transnational law, the idea that the transactions that take place between the colonial people, the, the imperial people, and the colonial people should be insulated from whatever law or whatever power the colonial people had. This insulation is best uh, exemplified by uh, the notion of extraterritoriality that operated in uh, China. So you, you remember the notion of extraterritoriality came about do, during the opium wars. The, the, the opium trade was resented by the Chinese people because it was obviously something that was injurious to their health. The Chinese emperor, the Chinese officials wanted to keep opium out of uh, China, but the British would not have it because they wanted uh, the, the, the tea trade, uh, the tea which was taken from China, uh, and uh, transplanted in India to flourish, and of course they wanted to ensure that opium was traded with China so that they could use the profits of opium trade in order to run India. So if you read uh, uh, Amitav Ghosh's novels, you would find uh, uh, this, this idea being played upon uh, quite uh, effectively, the idea that opium trade was so vital in the running of uh, the empire for the British. So what we have here is that uh, opium trade is in China is priced open by the use of force. The Opium Wars, on which there's again a very nice book by uh, a lady called Lovell who teaches at uh, the SOS. Uh, she, she writes about the pain that the Chinese people felt uh, when uh, the Opium Wars took place. And each time we, we, I go to China, if I want to see a Chinese international lawyer jump up and down, I have to talk to him about the opium war. And uh, this is something that really makes uh, the Chinese get very furious. The idea that there was this, this notion of extraterritoriality that uh, <clears throat> had been imposed upon them. We think of China as not having been colonized, but that is not so, because successive European powers entered China and imposed this system of extraterritoriality, set up their own courts, ensured that uh, the trade relations that uh, each of the traders, a German trader with uh, a Chinese, an English trader with, uh, the, uh, the, with the Chinese, was subjected to uh, the, the law of uh, the foreign traders, uh, uh, the law of the foreign traders country. They had a distinct system of courts that was administered uh, that, that was set up to administer the different contracts that came about. So extraterritoriality, which uh, was practiced in uh, China, in uh, Thailand, and in some countries of the Middle East, was also very similar. The object of extraterritoriality was the insulation of uh, was the insulation of uh, 
uh, of uh, relations that uh, the foreigner makes with these countries from the scope of the power of the local authorities, the Chinese authorities, as far as China was concerned. So the doctrine of extraterritoriality then again is a way of lifting out the commercial transaction from the scope of the power of the Chinese emperor and subjecting it to the power of uh, European courts. Now in the 1950s then we have the same idea being operated on by, uh, by uh, the English and other arbitrators, particularly in respect <coughs> of petroleum. Empire had come to an end and that was, necess was necessary to construct a means through which you would have uh, uh, the vestiges of empire being continued. And this was done largely through the instrumentality of the law. The idea was that if there is a concession agreement in a Middle Eastern country, Saudi Arabia or, 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 or uh, some place like uh, Abu Dhabi, what would happen would be that that concession agreement would not be subject to the law of the host state, but would be lifted out, like out, out of the scope of the national laws of that country. This lifting out, you know, it's like a Indian yogi levitating. You make a contract, <laughs> but somehow the contract rises up and attaches itself to a, a, a superior system. It just leaves the, the, the host state's control and gets subjected to the control of a foreign arbitral tribunal, which would not apply Saudi Arabian law, but would apply what would be considered general principles of law. And there would be enforcement of that award through the different courts of Europe, because you would have conventions like the New York Convention or other conventions that uh, that uh, ensure the enforcement of arbitration awards, uh, ensuring that these awards are, are enforced. So what happens, what happens even to this date then is that there is uh, in place a system that protects the contracts that foreign investors make with different uh, host states of the world, which would of course mean that uh, the hands of these states would become tied, tied up. The objection that one would have to this, uh, this system of transnational law, as I would call it, would be that uh, it ties up the hands of the, the, the developing countries from disposing of or having other ideas re relating to the disposal of their natural resources, which form an essential basis of their economies you tie up their natural resources through a series of contracts which would be enforced through the system of arbitration. Transnational law then becomes a purveyor of poverty. One would argue that as long as this system remains, a developing country that is dependent on natural resources will not be able to devise methods other than those prescribed by the multinational corporations that run the state. First, the multinational corporations like Vittoria before or Rocious before would argue that they are acting to the benefit <laughs> of the, the, the Africans or the Asians. They would say that they bring economic development, they uh, bring assets into the country, they bring new technology into the country, that economic development is not possible if not for the advent of uh, the multinational corporation into the country, despite the fact that there is massive exploitation of the resources that take place. Now, the, 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 in addition to this uh, picture that existed in the 1950s, in the 1960s and the 1970s, we have uh, a new uh, idea coming about, the making of bilateral investment treaties. So from 1950s, uh, 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 59 onwards, we have a profusion of uh, bilateral investment treaties uh, coming into the picture, the object of which, object of which treaty would be to give uh, inflexible protection 
to the foreign investment. Again, there's a system of arbitration that is set up principally by the World Bank, a system known as uh, the international, uh, the, uh, a center known as the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes is set up and now we have a profusion of treaties and a profusion of cases which have been brought up on the basis of those treaties. Now you would of course say treaties are part of international law, they are not a part of transnational law. But my answer to that would be that what happens is that there is a sort of a, a work in tandem between the treaties which are a part of, tra of public law and the arbitration awards which are a part of uh, an effort to regulate private transactions, right? I mean, there are transactions between the state and the foreign transnational corporation, which does have features of public law, but are assimilable more to private transactions. So what happens then is that this body of uh, law that uh, applies to uh, uh, transactions which are akin to pri private transactions are subject to growth and development by a large number of uh, arbit arbitral tribunals. <coughs> so the profusion of awards that come about then build upon the standard of protection that is afforded to the multinational corporations. Let me give two illustrations. One illustration that I would take is uh, the reference to the idea in every treaty or in most treaties that uh, the foreign investor who comes in, the multinational company which comes in, must be provided fair and equitable treatment. Now this idea of fair and equitable treatment, any lawyer would know, is incapable of definition. You know, I mean, you define fairness, can you do that? Can you define equity? No, you cannot. Now this phrase, fair and equitable treatment, has existed in uh, investment treaties for over 50 years, or 60 years perhaps, without ever being interpreted, right? I mean, no one has sort of uh, been concerned with this treaty. You know, I mean, I, I write a lot about this, and uh, in 1992 when I wrote the first edition of my book, uh, I had uh, mentioned fair and equitable treatment in the book, and there was only half a page of uh, what a fair and equitable uh, treatment meant. Half a page, right? Not anymore. But by the time uh, we have uh, the fourth edition coming in, this half a page has developed into about 60 pages, right? And it's not, it's not my book. You would find about uh, at least eight other books written on the basis of PhD thesis on the fair and equitable treatment. Now what, the, what is the fair and equitable treatment? It comes about largely as a result of the Argentine crisis. The Argentine crisis happened uh, as a result of the adoption of neoliberal uh, political uh, and economic notions in Argentina in the 1970s. Argentina was the home of the Calvo Doctrine previously. The Calvo Doctrine was that uh, Argentina would not allow a foreign investor to use anything other than Argentina law, Argentinian law or, uh, or have any disputes settled otherwise than by <coughs> an Argentinian tribunal or court. Now in, 1970, uh, in 1990, the Argentinians ditched the Calvo Doctrine and signed a large number of bilateral investment treaties which provide for unilateral arbitration at the instance of the foreign investor. Not only that, in order to attract foreign investment, they also said that they would not nationalize foreign investment, that they would peg uh, the price of utilities, uh, 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 utility companies in Argentina to the price index in uh, the United States, and what more, the, the peso, the Argentinian peso, would be kept on parity with uh, the United States dollar. So these were assurances that were given to foreign investors. Now when the economic crisis came about as a result of uh, a withdrawal of, uh, sudden withdrawal of funds from Argentinian banks, uh, the Argentinians uh, found that they could not keep these promises. So they devalued uh, the Argentinian peso. 
they removed the price peg and uh, of course uh, the foreign investors large, large the, the american investors were very displeased that what uh, had taken place so we had a spate of uh, arbitrations against argentina at a time when it was going through this economic crisis most of them focused upon the fair and equitable treatment the idea being that when you give an assurance to a country and are not able to fulfill that assurance you defeat the legitimate expectations of the foreign investor and thereby violate the fair and equitable standard of treatment now this is a interpretation that has come about <coughs> and you can see that the interpretation is taken largely from english administrative law no other uh, I, uh, no other system no other major system employs this terminology of legitimate expectations as the english system does and nakedly then and you could sort of trace the arbitrators who were involved in this project they refer to the english law on on uh, legitimate expectations which is used in in order to provide a, a hearing to a person affected not to give him a substantive damage but only to give him a hearing so they use this device of administrative law in order to provide damages against argentina at a time when it was beaten and crawling on the ground after a major economic crisis and uh, the damages have run into several millions of dollars you know in uh, the the arbitration awards that were decided many millions of dollars were awarded against argentina argentina hasn't paid anything as yet there are still arbitration awards pending but you can understand the pain that a country would feel out of this system that has come about when it uh, has just finished undergoing a major economic crisis another development that has taken place in recent times is that when faced with a uh, 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 dispute that concerned uh, mm. uh, the uh, taking over of uh, a company a canadian company manufacturing a carcinogenic carcinogenic substance in california and uh, the uh, the canadian company brought an action against the united states the united states argued that uh, doing so that is national taking over or stopping the uh, manufacture of the substance was a uh, exercise of a regulatory power or as the americans would call it the exercise of a police power of a state so from that time of course there has been the recovery of the idea that when a state acts in pursuance of its regulatory power there could be no expropriation so you have the formula stated in all american treaties now that if you exercise the regulatory power of the united states and affect property there shall be no taking of property and that no compensation needs to be paid why do you want to shut down a canadian manufacturer of uh, cancer producing substance and then have to pay compensation that's not logical so the the law is stated in the treaties that you don't have to pay compensation for regulatory expropriations arbitral tribunals now say no that's not so now they say that there is a proportionality rule now where do they get this proportionality rule from it's it's taken out of uh, the decisions of uh, the european court on human rights on the right to property provisions of the first protocol to the european convention on human rights so what they say is that you you can take property but when a state takes property it must show that the taking of the property is proportionate to the mischief that was contained or the harm that was being regulated if there's an excess then you have to pay damages <coughs> to the excess that uh, can be shown now this rule of course is uh, not in the in the, in the in the treaty right and uh, it's not a rule that is accepted by all states for example in uh, english administrative law you do not have a proportionality rule 
Rather, you would say that the the measure that is taken should not be a reasonable measure. That the, the, the there are differences then, variations in within the European systems themselves. So you cannot say that the proportionality rule is a rule that is a general principle of law. Nevertheless, we find the arbitration tribunals now saying that even if there is a regulatory expropriation, you must demonstrate that uh, that uh, there is proportionality. I must finish in uh, about six minutes' time so that you can ask questions uh, of me. Uh, le let me go on then. The, the, the system that has come about, I must say, is a vicious system. As I have already said, it is a purveyor of poverty. It is also a purveyor of uh, the wrong type of international law because it concentrates exclusively upon the protection of the investor. Now you have another body of law parallel in the United States and in some European countries which uh, emphasize the misdeeds of the foreign investor. Of course, in India you had the Bhopal crisis. In Bangladesh, you had, uh, as somebody in the last panel pointed out, uh, the collapse of uh, the sweatshop. So what if the multinational does harm? I mean, should these factors not be taken into account when deciding investment cases? So what's happening is that as much as this body of, uh, of uh, cases, awards exist, there's also a parallel body which talks about uh, the need for environmental protection, the need for human rights, the need for the protection of cultural property. So there is then a fragmentation of the law that has taken place. There is uh, so much of emphasis within one regime, the regime relating to the protection of the property of transnational corporations, which is a neoliberal pro project, a project that makes the law an instrument that serves the objectives of uh, ideological preference for the multinational corp corporations' movement of assets around the world, and a law that is conscious of other factors, like the protection of labor standards, human rights, environmental standards, and uh, other concerns, protection of indigenous people, as in Ecuador, I see, I know that there are two Ecuador uh, persons here. I worked in Ecuador for some time, very lovely country. But there you have uh, the foreign oil company Chevron, for example, killing uh, Aboriginal people at uh, the Amazon basin in order to exploit oil resources. The courts interfere and uh, impose punishments on uh, the uh, foreign company. Foreign company goes to arbitration and there is a, a billion dollar award that has been made against Ecuador in respect of Chevron's uh, uh, exploit, uh, exploit oil uh, exploration contracts. So the picture is a, is a bad one really and of course the question arises as what could be done about this. The criticism that's often made against me is that I'm a bull in a china shop. I go and destroy this beautiful system that has been brought, up, brought about through arbitration, through the writings of highly qualified publicists. Almost every uh, Huell professor at Cambridge has written on this, uh, <coughs> showing that uh, it's such a wonderful system that uh, has been developed. And of course, the question then is, how do you answer the fact that this system doesn't gel in with the other objects of international law? So states do are conscious of it, but they're not willing to give up this uh, this uh, this notion of uh, of investment protection through treaties. So what the the best that has come out of this is that there is a withdrawal by some states, principally small states like Bolivia, Venezuela, South Africa has withdrawn. So there is a complete withdrawal from the system. Other states have brought about what are known as balanced treaties. Balanced treaties, yeah. uh, end it soon. Balanced treaties meaning that uh, 
Now he tells me to talk and he says I shouldn't. <laughs> so I must comply. Balanced state is meaning that they would have defenses, right? The other alternative is the South African model, which goes back to making their own legislations the only uh, uh, avenue through which remedies could be had. But what we be, we are, people are conscious of this. The European Union, for example, has come out with the idea that there must be uh, this, uh, 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 an ending to the arbitration system and the institution of permanent courts. So clearly the European Commission is aware of it when it comes to negotiations with TTIP. So there are clearly the <clears throat> avenues being explored. My own preferred view would be the South African model. But Prabhagar tells me that I should stop talking here. Thank you very much.